Hi everyone, I'm Katie Couric and I'm really excited to be with you and very excited to have this next conversation. I'll be talking with Jennifer Auker. Jennifer is a behavioral scientist, author, and the General Atlantic Professor and the Culture Family Faculty Fellow at Stanford Graduate School of Business. She's a real smarty pants, but she's also fantastic. She's a leading expert on how meaning and purpose shape the choices we make how time can be spent in meaningful and unconventional ways, and also on the importance of human connection and gathering. Jennifer is the perfect person to be speaking with this reconvene audience today. Hi, Jen, I'm so happy to see you and really thrilled that we get to have this conversation. Me too, thank you, Katie. I wish we were together. I know. But soon that will happen. I know I you know I don't know about you but I walk out on the streets of New York and I know you're in California but I I feel like I don't know it's almost palpable people feel so happy part of it I think is because the weather's nice and the sun is shining but I also think that that I don't know it just feels like something has lifted and that of course is the pandemic and before we talk about what that means and kind of the re-entry process and gathering again which i know this audience is so interested in i want to talk a little bit about the impact of this pandemic you know i we were concerned both of us i mean this is something you study but something that i was actually really interested in is the increase in loneliness and social isolation that was going on pre-pandemic. And I wondered if you could talk a little, Jen, about how this was exacerbated during the pandemic and, and what this period of this really unprecedented period of time and has had the impact it's had on our overall well-being. Um, absolutely. So um, as we've all felt and experienced in the data shows, loneliness has increased. Um, and so you and I were together, I think it was in 2013, talking about happiness and meaning actually at Stanford. And um, we already saw some you know, hints of increased sense of loneliness going on then. And then with the pandemic, everything has accelerated. So loneliness has increased. Mental well-being has been on the decline, especially for teens. Um, there was a recent study that just came out, reported by HBR, it was 1,500 people in 46 countries, and the vast majority of the people sampled reported um, a decline in well-being, uh, mental health issues, uh, and then key predictors of burnout were on the increase. Uh, people mentioned unsustainable workload, the absence of a supportive community, and that feeling of a connection, and just that feeling you don't have control over your life and work. And one of the biggest reasons for this decline is this inability to feel connected to others in the broader world. And we should talk about the physical uh, manifestation of, uh, of that because, uh, you know, of course, it has an impact on your physical health. Being lonely is the equivalent of smoking two packs of cigarettes a day in terms of the adverse consequences on your overall well-being. So there, you know, we talk, hear about the mind-body connection, but this feeling of so, social isolation can really do bad things for your overall health, can it? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're a social species and our brains are literally wired to encourage social behavior. So um, there's actually a large part of neural infrastructure that's dedicated to other people. You're tracking other people, having a sense of belonging, feeling like you're part of a group. All of this is deeply ingrained. And when you're stuck at home during a pandemic and you have to rely on social media or other digital tools to fulfill these needs, it's just not the same thing. You know, we were talking about uh, when you and I connected in preparation for this about the fact that, you know, this is the kind of, communication people have been having over the last year plus. They've been doing Zooms, they've been doing FaceTime. Uh, and, and I'm curious about that kind of connectivity versus in-person connectivity um, and what the difference is because it's helped, but it has been no substitute, has it? No, no. I mean, first of all, when you're together, like physically together in a gathering with others, um, you know, one of the biggest, you know, differences versus what we're experiencing right now is the, 
you know, the chemical releases from a neurochemical perspective, the in-person experience is really different. You're more likely to experience endorphins, like, you know, what you feel when you have a runner's high, you're more likely to experience an oxytocin release. And that's often called, that's like a trust or a love horm uh, hormone that's released during, you know, physical touch um, and not just like childbirth and sex, but also, you know, just seeing someone and, you know, touching them um, in a non-sexual way. So even in these contexts, you know, you get these neurochemical releases that just don't occur when you're interacting um, in digital formats. And a second thing, you know, is just boredom. You know, there used to be that, um, ironically, um, you know, you would think that in our our current world that we would be actually, you know, uh, more bored because there's this lack of phys physical uh, connection, gathering, but you also see a lot of evidence of people, you know, burning out, not being bored and not being able to actually have time and space to breathe, do things that actually release the tension of what our current world is, is increasing. So I think this whole world of, you know, digital connection as being our main form of connection has led to, you know, burnout and, um, and you know, depression in many cases. Eric Yan, the CEO of Zoom, actually talks about that, right? And you had a conversation about Zoom burnout. And, and what is it? Is it just, um, you know, what? why are people having Zoom burnout? Obviously, because they're spending a lot of time on Zoom. But did you all talk about what's causing it and sort of even the, the impact of this digital world on our brains and on our kind of over, overall well-being? Yeah, I mean, Eric um, has experienced Zoom burnout. You know, he talks about like one day having 17 Zoom meetings back to back and experiencing this incredible wave of, of burnout, of like a, a mental sort of shift. Um, there are, so, so one of it is just like the unrelenting, you know, constant nature of interacting with that tiny little hole that I'm looking, you know, at you with. Yeah. And, um, you know, we know things can mitigate it, and he's been studying it as well. Um, you know, small little breaks in the day, other ways of having sort of physical, um, you know, exercise or interaction with people within the household, et cetera. But what's really exciting is now that we're getting more vaccinations, we're seeing the positive impact of all of these vaccinations, and we're starting to come closer to the ability to have these social gatherings and be able to not necessarily return to normal, but be able to offset this incredible burnout that Eric and all of us are experiencing. I think you know, it's a time to start feeling hopeful and also thoughtful about how we want to kind of reset, re-enter, you know, come back into this sort of next chapter of our collective lives. Which is so exciting. And the other thing, though, before we talk about kind of, you know, the after of COVID, I want to mention one other thing about the before. I don't know about most people watching or listening to our conversation, but I also think, you know, this, this kind of work-life balance got so blurred that I couldn't really remember what day of the week it was, much less, you know, there wasn't a delineation between work you know, going someplace and I think, and, and home and being able to take a break. So everything kind of just got mushed together. And of course our devices, I think we're starting that, you know, starting to uh, push us in that direction, but even more so it just, to your point, we couldn't figure out when can we stop working and, and, and kind of have a break. So I think it really screwed up how you know our brains a little bit am i nuts or is that something that you've heard and that's a separate issue i know we can discuss it later <laughs> let's pull apart all of those questions are you nuts we'll <laughs> handle that over cocktail yeah, let's table that for now jen <laughs> but yes and i'm not going to answer the question of what day it is because i also do not know um <laughs> but um but yeah i think that it has had a significant impact on um, not just our brains, but also um, the way in which we're behaving now and how we plan to behave, um, you know, over the next three months, six months and onward. 
Um, now, not all of the blurriness between home and work is negative. So before we like maybe talk a little bit about um, you know, some of the negative and how we might want to change our lives, um, I did want to mention one positive that I've been seeing in the classes that I teach and the executives that I teach um, as well. And that is this ability for people to just show up in more human ways. So for example, before this session, someone's kid came in to get some Legos. And it was just this wonderful moment of like, yep, you know, is my child gonna come in to get Legos? So there's this, this great opportunity for all of us to be on this equal playing field um, and to have the opportunity to introduce kind of, I don't know, our own more, I don't know, authentic Kennedy. or holistic selves to everyone else. And in fact, I, some of my favorite videos have been like when some expert is on a news show and the kid comes in and the mother is going in and trying to get, you know, the kid out of the frame. And it is so funny. And you're right. I think that actually glimpsing into people's personal space spaces has really allowed us to kind of get in touch with their humanity and as a result, our own. Does that make yeah, sense? Yeah, absolutely. And that piece of it, as we think about how we move forward, and, you know, I hope that really stays. I have a friend who's at Salesforce and um, was recently meeting with her and she had her five-year-old make signs for her to hold up in these important meetings. Like, what are the next steps? And you're on mute. And so like, literally it was a show. It was so much more entertaining and productive um, with that integration in. And well, well, also the humor, and we're going to talk about your book and about the role humor plays in all of this in a minute. But one of the things that I was really struck by is that something like 40% of people are excited to quit their jobs post pandemic. I mean, this has been a significant reset for people trying to figure out what am I doing? Why am I here? A lot of existential questions were posed during this period in a in a really good way. So what do you think has led to that? I mean, that's almost half of all people thinking about quitting their jobs. That's a lot of people who are like, WTF, you know, what was I doing before this? And, and now why, you know, I want to do, I want to change my life. So what, where did that come from? Yeah, well, first of all, I mean, think about it. Since last February, oh, more than 100,000 U.S. businesses have closed permanently. And then, you know, 40, 40 41 percent of these workers in a pretty large scale study run by um, HBR, you know, said that working remotely, um, working longer hours, juggling family demands, you know, threatened job security and fear of unsafe work conditions is all driving this, this, you know, desire to really rethink their lives um, and certainly their jobs. And as you intimated, part of this is just a, a real reset of what is really important to me? What is really meaningful for me? And, um, you know, moving into this pandemic, you had your job, you had your family, um, you know, you had your friends, you, you know, live this, this life that you kind of designed and then everything got thrown into chaos and all of us have experienced just remarkable tragedy, um, some more than others, but um, it's this opportunity to, in fact, think about what is really important. And that self-discussion is, is actually quite profound and important, existential too. Yeah. And, you know, I, I should just, I want to put one caveat in there and that is so many women have been uh, you know, affected by the pandemic, a disproportionate number of women. So when we look at that statistic, we should probably consider that a huge number, I think 2.5 million have dropped out of the workforce and it's set us back many decades. This is a whole different panel discussion we could have, but in many ways, this isn't people just kind of saying, oh, I, I didn't have a life of meaning. It was a lot of women saying, I can't do it all. And that's, that's another discussion, as I said, all together. But on that note, can we talk about so much of your work has focused on happiness and a, a life, a happiness versus a life of meaning. So can you talk about the difference between the two and what some of your 
fantastic research Jen has shown about how people can seek one and how they should probably seek one over the other. Absolutely. And I think also, you know, um, it, it, the story that you just painted or the, that you just shared about the women having my many women having to leave the, the workforce, I think is emblematic of, of this work of like saying, I can't do it all. And what is really meaningful for me right now? And the reality is, is, you know, my family and social connections, that is what is important. So and part also, of Jen, though, it could be emblematic of, of some societal issues and a lack of support systems in this country for working mothers, but I'll get off my soapbox, continue. No, I, I, I agree and endorse and echo that thought. Um, Again, in the other panel that we'll do, when we can guide, dive into the Nordics, for example, um, we can talk about how do you set up that, that, that structure in more effective ways. Um, and it does actually harken back to this question around what is happiness and what is meaningfulness and how are these things different? So to answer your question, some of the work that I've done with my colleagues tries to pull apart these two constructs. And so I'm gonna ask you these questions that we ask our subjects. So Katie, you know, to what degree do you feel your life is really happy right now? Um, and you'll answer on a one to seven scale. So seven being very happy, one being not at all. What would you say? Six. Okay. To what degree do you feel you have a meaningful life right now? Same scale, seven being very meaningful, one being not at all. Seven. Okay. Um, so what we'll do is we'll ask that to a large number of people. And a lot of people say, you know, very similar numbers for these two things, because they do, they are correlated about 0.5%, um, half, of, half, of the, half of the variance in these two constructs is, is correlated. But there's still a large number of people, especially younger people, who say that they have a happy but not meaningful life and a meaningful but not happy life. So we look at those two, you know, we pull them apart. We look at those two groups of people and we ask them all sorts of questions like how you spend your time. What do you believe about yourself? What do you believe about others? What values do you have? Things like this. And the three biggest differences that we find with the individuals that sort of say that, that they have happiness in their life, but not meaning uh, versus the, the flip is that happiness oriented people tend to be much more self oriented. Um, they say that they like to get gifts, they're takers. Um, individuals, um, they're also more likely to say, I like to feel good and I don't like to feel bad and I like to feel as good as possible, like optimizing positive affect. And then the third big difference is that they're really focused on how they feel right now. Like it's that hamster, the going in for like, you know, constant like pellets, like, how do I feel now? I want to feel better right now, and, you know, and it's very short term oriented. The individuals who have much more meaning in their life, maybe not as much happiness, they are very other oriented, more connected to others. They can read the room. They have greater degrees of empathy. They, um, they also say that they're other oriented and like to give. The second big difference is that they like to feel good too, but they also understand feeling negative, anxiety, fear, whatever we're all feel, feeling right now is part of life. It is what creates us you know, as humans. It gives meaning in life. And then the third big difference is that the meaningfulness individuals are focused on the past, the present, and the future, what actually creates meaning over time, not just how they feel right now. So those are the biggest differences. But um, one interesting study showed that when you tell people, you're going to spend the day, go be happy, versus you're going to spend the day, go create meaning, create a meaningful day. And then they come back to the lab and researchers ask them, how happy are you? The people in the happiness condition are actually less happy than the people in the meaningfulness condition. So we think we know what drives our happiness, but we don't act in ways that actually promote it. And we can go into that in, in more detail later. But the thing that's really interesting is that the only thing that these individuals in the meaningfulness condition did that was really different, they didn't spend more time with their best friends or partners they spent time in ways in social gatherings and even in any interaction with strangers feeling more connected. So they were more other oriented and even with strangers were experienced more connection. And that's what actually drove the, the longer lasting, more sustainable uh, feelings of happiness. And it's so otherness versus kind of like, what am I doing for myself? It's sort of, how am I, 
interacting? How am I, uh, you know, moving in the world? It's funny because I was thinking about it, Jen. You know, I I smile at everybody because I'm so like weirdly outgoing. Hopefully, I'm not a person who perpetuates toxic positivity, which is a new <laughs> thing I've just learned about. But, you know, I like smiling at people. I like smiling at the person I'm paying the coffee to, or, you know, that I bump into because we won't both want almond milk. You know, I like, I like kind of moving in the world that way. And mass has, that's really prevented me. You know, I still smile at people and I th- sometimes think I'm an idiot, like I'm smiling, but I have a mask on. They can't tell I'm smiling. But I think that will be so great now that we don't have to wear masks all the time to see people and to see them smile and to kind of, you know, absorb their their connection. And I'm excited about that because I imagine that's inhibited connection even further, right? Absolutely. First of all, people can see that you're smiling, especially you, um, because you're you're expressive (laughs) with your eyes. That's called the Duchenne smile where you're actually smiling. So, you know, if you look at eyes of people that are fake smiling, you can see that they didn't, you know, the crinkles aren't there, et cetera. And so even with masks, smiling matters, but even, you know, and this sounds really dorky, but hugs, you know, the ability to actually hug someone, which is now kind of also, I think, probably explaining some of the New York glee that you're feeling on the streets. Um, you know, as, as more people are vaccinated, that has gone so far as well. And so this ability to have this physical and also, um, you know, facial uh, uh, structure that actually makes people feel connected is super important. The other um, anecdote I really like, I remember you told me that um, at your church, I'm sorry, I don't know if you want to like talk about this, yeah, but it's okay. such a great story. Yeah. You know, just these small things, you notice that when you say something very simple, like, you know, peace be with you, um, that it, it, it shifted, you know, kind of the energy in the room and um, the church and it shifted the way people interact and just taking a moment and saying something simple like that um, also has uh, it goes a long ways to making people feel connected and reducing loneliness yeah it's it's it made my church feel so much warmer and you know and connected with the people and and there are a lot of steps that go to my church <laughs> was very happy when they started doing that. Anyway, let's talk about humor too. And then I want to talk for this gap, you know, how we can make successful gatherings for people. But your recent book is Humor Seriously, Why Humor is a Secret Weapon in Business and Life. And I want you to share with this audience that, uh, uh, you know, your insights about that, because it's so true. And it's not about being funny. It's not like, hey, did you hear the one about or but um bunch it's just about, I think it's almost more about levity and seeing the light and the humor in all kinds of situations. Can you just talk a little bit about what your research showed and what your book talks about? Yeah, one of the biggest things that we're missing in the lack of this physical gathering and these social connections is honestly just the ability to laugh with people. But even before the global pandemic, um, in, you know, impacted us so significantly. There was data suggesting that we have really stopped smiling and laughing. And laughter is this social glue that, that really does bond people. So this is um, data reported by Gallup. It's um, based on over 1.5 million people, globe, 166 countries. People were asked a very simple question, which is, did you smile or laugh yesterday? Um, and people say yes when they're 16, 18, and 20. And all of a sudden, around 23, it plummets, like plummets. It goes to no, and it doesn't become yes again until people retire, like 70, 80, 90. Uh, You know, the good news is, of course, around 90-year-olds, we all become comedian sensations. But until then, those are like about 50 way too serious years. Um, And what we, what we, you know, it's, it's a travesty in many regards, partly um, for a couple of reasons. One, you know, when you laugh together with someone, even if it's over Zoom, but it's definitely enhanced in person, you know, you, you get these chemical reactions, you get redu- reduced levels of cortisol, you get that increased level of endorphin we talked about in oxytocin. Um, and so- um, It can also impact memory, right? 
Yeah, absolutely. You have, you know, moments where you laugh together actually are ingrained in our brain to a greater degree. And, and, um, and it has a huge impact on how you feel about just yourself and also others. So one of my favorite studies, um, their researchers ask couples, um, and this works in the work environment as well, but they ask couples, remember memories. What were the memories of you sharing laughter together? So that was what half of the couples did. The other half of the couples were asked to just simply share memories, um, you know, where they were happy together. And then the researchers came back at a later point in time and asked the couples how happy they are, how satisfied they are in their relationship. The couples that were in the shared laughter condition and remember those shared laughter moments reported to be 23% happier in their relationship. Like, let me just say that again. These relationships, these social connections were 23% elevated, even though like all you did was remember a moment of shared laughter and laughter is free. Uh, so think about how much money you're spending on therapy, not like you are, but <laughs> one might be. And now I'll subtract that by 100% while being a quarter more satisfied in your relationship. It's remarkable. It, yeah, I'm thinking about the moments that I, I laugh with my husband every day. I mean, it's not perfect, but he makes me laugh so much. I just love his sense of humor. And I think he told me last night that my breast smelled like bad mustard. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, now, God, I was so funny. You went to anyway. Chicago, is that right? Yeah. yeah. So we find that University of Chicago people in general, and one of my dear friends, Madhav, is the dean there, so I know this. They tend to have a humor style that's very sniper-oriented, so it's kind of dry and um, maybe a little edgy, oh, very similar to the mustard joke, yes. And, um, and to your point, like humor isn't the same thing as being funny, and in fact, it's quite the opposite. You know, it's definitely not about being funny or trying to be funny. It's just having that mindset of levity and being able to laugh more generously. And one of the biggest ways into that kind of way of operating, which is especially important as we live in a moment that feels quite dark with cancel culture, climate, you know, concerns, um, and not to mention, you know, divisiveness within America is just being able to understand each other's humor styles like you did, you know, with your husband. And what Naomi Bagdonas, my co-author and I have found is that there's these four humor styles. So I'm going to really quickly tell them to you. And I think I know which one you are, but you'll have to confirm. So there is the sniper, which I think your husband is, and they're edgy <laughs> and dry. They're the masters of the unexpected dig. And then there's the stand-up, and they're bold and irreverent, unafraid to ruffle a few feathers to get a laugh. So think Amy Schumer or Eddie Murphy or any friend who thought that a wedding speech means a devastating roast. <laughs> and then there's the sweetheart, and they're earnest and understated and use humor that lightens the mo mood. So Bowen Yang scores high here, Jimmy Kimmel, Dimitri Martin. He once said this thing, um, which I love, whenever I'm at my computer, I don't type LOL, I type. LQTM, laugh quietly to myself, it's more honest. <laughs> and then there's the magnet and they're expressive, charismatic and easy to make laugh. So kind of more Jimmy Fallon or Maya Rudolph. So which one do you think you are and which one do you think maybe your kids are and your husband? I think my daughter, younger daughter is the sniper. Is that what it's called? Yes. Uh, and I think my older daughter is the sweetheart. And I think I'm the magnet. You are well represented. <laughs> so now you just need to have a stand up. Do you have a dog or a cat? Are they by chance like a stand up? No, no, I don't have any stand ups. I'm trying to think. Uh, I'm trying to think of people in my life who are stand ups. I'm going to have to I'm going to have to think about that. What are you, Jen? I now will now that we have a book on humor, seriously. Um, I shift my style significantly. Like I think at base right now as a mom, as many moms are, I'm a sweetheart, right? I got voted the least funny person, by the way, in my family, which contains a husband, three kids and a dog. I'm less funny than the dog. Um, and, but you know, with you, I might be more magnet oriented because I think you tend to be, and that also, you know, 
it just helps become infectious. Yeah, I think um, so when, you, when, just, when, when, when you appreciate other people's humor, I think that invites people to be, to see more levity, right? Exactly. And I'm a good audience. People. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hey, listen, before we go, I have to ask you about gathering because I think now everyone's going to be so excited to get together. Everyone who's watching this is excited for in-person connections. Um, how can they foster really, you know, hospitable environments and help people? Because I also think our social skills are a bit rusty, you know, and for some people that means social anxiety when they get into crowds. How can we create an environment where people are going to really appreciate and take full advantage of these in-person gatherings? Yep. Okay. So three things. One, plan the gatherings. Even if you cancel the gatherings, uh, neurologically, when we plan those gatherings, actually the mesolimbic region lights up. So you actually get pleasure just planning them. Number two, you know, really thinking about other sort of ways to complement the gathering. So like, you know, dropping gifts off on the day of the gathering um, to enhance it or starting that gathering with kind of, a, you know, an opening ritual that tends to make everyone feel like they're on the same page. Um, Stephen Curry does this, by the way, really well, both in the Warriors and outside of the Warriors. Um, we have a great story about him in our book. And then the third thing really is this idea of kind of branding it or branding the ritual, branding the experience, branding it. So there's a, a, like a name that people can refer to and feel like they're part of a group. And that actually makes it much, much higher in terms of utility. Um, and people remember it more fondly and more easily. Well, I have to make you, you have to be part of my book tour and help me organize it. So, cause I really want to assemble people and, and help them find not only connection, but joy and inspiration too. I want, want to leave them feeling like, wow, this, this was really, this, if it didn't change my life, it enhanced my life, right? I would love that. I was lucky enough to read two chapters of your book. I've already pre-ordered it, five copies. Thank and you. I completely agree. Reading that um, makes people reflect on their own life and change the way that they, they look. I, I want to say one last thing too. This, um, we're actually doing, um, we're making our students read both your newsletter and your podcast, listen to your wow. podcast because Jennifer Gardner is visiting our Humor Serious Business Class um, this week. And you have just a phenomenal um, podcast with her as well as you know newsletter content that actually backs that up. So um, I think that Thank all of the ways that you express your stories has such a profound impact, not just in our students, but more broadly. Well, I think story storytelling really does connect us. You know, there's something about reading other people's stories, uh, caring about other people's stories mm -hmm. that actually reduces kind of feelings of social isolation and loneliness, kind of uh, exposing all of us to the human condition. So that's what I try to do in my podcasts. And that's what I try to do with my newsletter. So thank you for thank you for appreciating both because. Um, you know, you, you want to put things out in the world that are are received and and, you know, it's like a tree falling in the forest. If nobody's there to hear it, did it really fall? So thank you for that, Jen. And thank you for all your great work. I think, um, you know, this is so important. I think people probably for a long time thought it was a little woo woo. Right. And and it it has such an impact on how we live our lives and having a life of meaning and understanding what will really make us happy is so important because listen, we're all terminal. We have a finite amount of time on the planet and we want to make the most of uh, most of it. So thank you, Jen, for this great conversation. Thank you, Katie. Thanks everybody.